It's cold, but I'm happy and excited. It's midwinter in coastal North Carolina. During this time of the year, you'll see huge windswept fields. Coastal marshes and rivers will be crusted with ice. And if you're lucky, you'll see snow. But my favorite things this time of the year are the birds of winter. There is no better place to begin a study of the birds of winter than on the Albemarle Peninsula of eastern North Carolina. The migratory bird species that depend on this region are part of a much bigger story of natural diversity. North Carolina is a place where North meets South. Because of our temperate climate and location along the Mid-Atlantic, many plants and animals are at the northernmost or southernmost part of their range, making this state an ecological wonderland. For many people, the migratory waterfowl that call North Carolina home are among the most beautiful and awe-inspiring parts of our great tapestry of natural diversity. Many early travelers and naturalists noted the extraordinary variety of wildlife in North Carolina. John Lawson wrote in his book, A New Voyage to Carolina, printed in 1709, of a moderate climate and fertile soil, and the other benefits of plenty of fish, wildfowl, and venison. He also wrote of two sorts of swans, which, in his words, come in great flocks in the winter and stay commonly in the fresh rivers till February, and others that abide more in salt water. He described geese, including one type with black heads and necks, and another species he called a white brant, about which he wrote, it is very plentiful and is all over as white as snow, except the tips of the wings that are black. He was describing trumpeter and tundra swans, also known as whistling swans, Canada geese and snow geese. The significance of this area cannot be overstated. A successful wintering season for migratory waterfowl here contributes dramatically to the reproductive success of many species that nest thousands of miles to the north. Wendy Stanton is a biologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It is her job to make sure that the birds of winter at the National Wildlife Refuge where she works have what they need during their five to six month stay in North Carolina each year. Eastern North Carolina is very important for wintering waterfowl. It's a combination of the refuge lands that are managed specifically for the habitat for waterfowl, large lakes, and croplands. The primary goal for providing wintering habitat for these waterfowl is to provide loafing or resting habitat and foraging habitat. This is essential for the survival of these birds. They must have the foraging habitat to build fat reserves or energy reserves to make that long migration back to the breeding grounds. And once at the breeding grounds, they need to be healthy enough, have the energy reserves built up to be able to reproduce successfully. All of the birds on the refuge have unique characteristics, unique life histories. Two of my favorites are the tundra swan and the snow geese. The tundra swans disperse in small family groups, usually three to four birds, up to maybe 12 birds on occasion. The snow geese, when they are flying, there are up to tens of thousands of birds in a flock. One of the things I do on the refuge is leg band and collar the waterfowl to learn more about their natural history. Some of the information I gain from this data includes survivorship, how long do these birds live, migration routes, where along these migration routes are these birds stopping to rest. 
Wendy has a unique way of describing the territory between the Pamlico River and Albemarle Sound. This area is actually the largest international airport in the state of North Carolina. Our tundra swans are migrating from eastern Alaska and western Canada. Our snow geese are migrating from the Arctic region in Canada. And our ducks are migrating from the prairie pothole regions from midwestern United States and Canada. There must be an excellent traffic control system in place because there are never collisions, even when flights approach in very tight formations. Takeoffs occur without a hitch over land and water. Landings are always flawless in good weather and bad. Even at night, flights operate safely over North Carolina's largest international airport. Over the years, the landscape has changed in parts of eastern North Carolina. Pine forests and swamps were cleared, altering habitats for migratory waterfowl. There were also large farming operations, such as those at Lake Madame Mesquite. At the beginning of the 20th century, the rich and famous often came to North Carolina to hunt at several of the elegant hunt clubs. Migratory waterfowl also had to withstand the pressure of market hunters and those collecting feathers for women's hats. The wood duck was almost made extinct because of demand for its beautiful feathers. But in spite of these pressures, the birds kept coming to their ancestral destination each winter. Now, with several important national wildlife refuges, state parks, and enlightened farming practices, the area is one of the most significant destinations for migratory waterfowl on the East Coast. Management of a national wildlife refuge has a clear focus and uses experts to get results. Howard Phillips is manager of one of the national wildlife refuges used by the birds of winter. Well, refuges are different from parks and forests uh, in a lot of different ways, but primarily in their mission. Uh, parks and forests uh, have missions to provide recreational opportunities for people or for timber or for a combination of those things. In the refuge system, we try to provide habitat for wildlife. That's our primary mission, and we always try to put wildlife first in everything that we do. The types of activities that are available at individual refuges really depend on that refuge and what that refuge was set up for. But in general, there's a lot of different activities that are available at most refuges. They include things like wildlife observation and photography, 
environmental education and interpretation, and even fishing. Some refuges also allow hunting, but again, it depends on the purpose for which that refuge was set up and whether or not it, that activity is compatible with that purpose. As far as providing food for the birds, we do a couple of different things here on the refuge. One is we plant crops, including corn and winter wheat, that the birds will use. But more importantly, we manage our moist soil units to produce natural vegetation that's very important to the bird's diet. Although the movements of these birds cannot be predicted with certainty, there are some rhythms and cycles, if you will, uh, that we go by. Generally speaking, we'll start seeing the early migrants, the smaller ducks like teal, in late August or September. The snow geese and the tundra swan will start arriving generally around the first full moon in November. Our peak numbers of waterfowl will occur in December or January, and then the numbers will gradually drop off until sometime in March when most of the birds have gone back to their breeding grounds in the north. Even though the stars of this show are the swans and snow geese, the area attracts Canada geese. and many species of ducks, including pintail, mallard, meganser, and shoveler. But of all the birds that call North Carolina home, for me, none comes close in beauty to the wood duck, some of which are locals and some migratory. They are truly in a league of their own. Ducks and geese are not the only feathered creatures in the area. There are swarms of mixed flock blackbirds, including starlings, brown-headed cowbirds, grackles, and red-winged blackbirds. The abundant food in the area also attracts raptors, such as the bald eagle, northern harrier, and the great horned owl. You'll also find wading birds, such as the regal, great blue heron. And if you're lucky, you'll see the elusive wild turkey. Even when you aren't seeing birds, animal signs, like this beaver lodge, and the freshly chewed handiwork of a beaver are everywhere. At your feet, you'll see signs of life in the form of animal tracks. Deer tracks are common on the roads, in fields, and besides streams. Also common are the footprints of black bear. Otter, raccoon, and a variety of other mammals. If you are lucky, you may even see some of the critters that make the tracks. Deer, bobcat, otter, and black bear. All of these creatures, living in the same areas with resident and migratory birds, mean an intricate and healthy ecosystem. Almost anyone who has ever owned a pocket knife has tried their hand at wood carving. Wood carving and the birds of winter are part of the fabric of society in coastal communities. Helping to preserve this tradition, is Roy Willis at the Core Sound Waterfowl Museum on Harker's Island. Decoy carving started mainly after the Civil War. 
uh, the people that hunted uh, and fished, they're the people that did most of the uh, decoy carving. Uh, they done the decoy carving as a supplement for their income, and they also as table fire. Uh, as time passed, and people had more leisure time. The sports started in the area, and uh, guides started carving to have decoys for the uh, hunters that came down. The materials they used to make decoys with were mainly uh, material that would float good in the water, and that is either juniper, white pine, cypress, and whatever they found is what they made their decoys out of. When they needed a lighter decoy, some people started making them out of canvas. They would st stretch canvas or a wire frame and a wooden bottom board. And they did this uh, mainly after outboard motors came into effect. But like I say, most of the carving was done at night. Uh, after they would chop out the bodies, they would go to the country store and sit around and talk and whittle on the heads, carve the heads. And uh, that, that was just mainly the way it was done. Today it is still possible to buy slick or working decoys. Many are now categorized as detailed works of art. While carvers know the shapes and colors of our northern visitors, other observers look at them from different perspectives. One of the keenest observers is Walt Sturgeon assistant director of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and president of the International Wild Waterfowl Association. Well, here in coastal North Carolina, mate selection takes place amongst the waterfowl, especially the snow geese and the tundra swans. And then the male will follow the uh, female back to her natal area. And this is particularly important with respect to spreading the gene pool across the Arctic. As these birds are feeding, they're building their body mass and that is particularly important because as they go north, they only have time to sort of build that nutritional reserve so that they're ready to lay that first egg when they get to the Arctic. Well, here in North Carolina, we have a golden opportunity to study the uh, tundra swans specifically because they gather up in large groups. We're able to put neck collars on them, leg bands, radios. It gives us an opportunity to follow them back north because when they get back north, they spread out and their territories might be a, a full square mile, so it's very difficult for a biologist to come up with any amount of uh, information on the birds in the north. Even for scientists, there are as many questions as answers concerning the birds of winter. For example, almost all school children learn that in many species, the female is always drab, and the male is beautiful and gaudy. We learn that the female of many bird species is drab for camouflage purposes so that she can protect her eggs and her young. The beautiful plumage of many male ducks, like the merganser, may attract mates. For males, it is like a beauty contest in the swamps. Distinguishing male from female for most birds of winter is not a problem. In swans and geese, however, males and females look identical. So much so that scientists have to look very closely in a way that is probably embarrassing for swans and humans to tell male from female. Here there are lots of theories, but no single answer. For starters, for swans and snow geese, white is camouflage. Secondly, 
since unlike ducks, pairs of swans and geese mate for life. The gaudy plumage found in many species to attract mates is unnecessary. Since they are paired for life, the question is often asked if they ever break up, or will they take another mate? In both swans and geese, it has been shown that if pairs experience nest failures for a couple of seasons, they will sometimes split up, almost like getting a divorce, and look for more productive mates. It has also been observed that if one mate dies, the survivor often seeks a new partner. Another frequently asked question about the birds of winter is, how do they navigate the tens of thousands of miles to and from their nesting grounds and wintering grounds? Some of the possibilities include the use of topographical features, such as mountains, lakes and rivers, and even cities. Since they do fly at night, the location of the stars and position of the sun and moon may help birds on long trips like they help ship captains of old. Work has also been done to show that migratory birds may also have an internal magnetic compass to help them find their way to and from nesting sites, stopover sites, and their wintering grounds. Regardless of how they do it, these magnificent birds are attracted to North Carolina by special conditions found in only a few places that give them the best opportunity to rest feed and store energy. No one appreciates these birds and their North Carolina habitat more than Betsy Bennett, director of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. This region is not only a natural treasure for North Carolina, it's a natural treasure for this country, like the Everglades. It is one of the finest classrooms for teacher education in North Carolina. Wow. What a day. Thank you for joining us for another adventure on exploring North Carolina. We hope you've enjoyed your visit with the birds of winter. For additional information about this or other episodes, go to these websites. Exploring North Carolina is made possible by major financial support from DTS Software, Mainframe Storage Management Solutions, Additional support for this series is provided by the Friends of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, the largest natural history museum in the Southeast and a major center for education and research in the natural sciences. Let it be your field guide to the treasures of North Carolina and beyond. And by UNC TV viewers like you.